tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Wow. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests, Lee Newman and Mink Stoll, are in the studio waiting to be profiled. Singer, songwriter, guitarist, Lee Newman grew up in Hollywood. After Hollywood High and UCLA went to New York to study with Michael Chekhov and Oscar-winning actress Beatrice Strait, how long did it take a California boy like you to come back to L.A.? It took about um, three years. <laughs> That's all? Yeah, you know. <laughs> did you I mean, get enough acting in? Yeah, well, growing up, you know, I mean, I grew up here in, in Hollywood and I went to Hollywood High School. <laughs> and the day after I graduated from UCLA, I moved to New York. And my family and friends thought I would last two months. Oh. And, you know, I mean, coming from Los Angeles, where everybody walks around half naked in December, you know, they didn't think I'd be able to deal with the, uh, the winters. Oh. Uh, they were right. By the third year, um, it was time to come back to Los Angeles. What brought you back? Um, I got the biggest opportunity for me um, to work with Harry Nielsen on a show called The Point. Oh. And um, Harry Nielsen was the biggest influence on me musically. He wrote um, a show called The Point about a boy named Oblio and, uh, who was born round-headed and the land of point where everybody, oh. the people and the places, they all had a point on the top <laughs> of their heads uh, except this little boy Oblio. And the only he friend he had was his dog Arrow and that's where the song Me and My Arrow comes from. Oh. Well, he wrote songs. Too, oh yeah, right? he wrote. I'm going to show a picture of you and Harry Nelson. He wrote songs like "One Is the Loneliest Number." Oh right. He wrote and sang the theme song to the courtship of Eddie's father. Remember that show with Bill I Bixby? I do. I remember a lot of his songs because he was very popular for a short period yeah. of time. Well, his biggest hit as a singer was a song called "Everybody's Talking," for Midnight Cowboy. You know, and uh, I think what held Harry back from being a huge pop star is he never performed live uh, musically. Oh, yeah. So he was always in the studio. But for me as a child, he was a tremendous influence uh, because at the time my mother was working on a show called Laughing. And she was working for Dick Martin, and Dick's golf partner was Bill Bixby, who was about to do this show called oh. The Courtship of Ace Father. Oh. And it was through Bill Bixby that I got into Harry Nielsen. And um, so he's really the main reason why I want to, you know, sing and write songs and play guitar. And, no, that you know. can't be the main reason. Yeah. You come from this terribly musical yeah. background. Yeah. He may have been a big motivating he was, force. He was, yeah, he was a big influence um, on me. And uh, I'm just so grateful I had the chance to work with him on the stage version of The Point when I came back from New York. But he passed away very young. Yeah, he died at the age of uh, 51 or 52. And um, it was uh, sad to see him go. He, he left seven kids. <gasps> and, uh, but just a wonderful singer but and he a left wonderful a, songwriter. He left a lot of music. Oh, yeah. Which I think we're starting to hear again. You're starting to hear it more as songs are being used more in movies and in, in commercials. And uh, he had a huge hit with um, a song called I Can't Live If Living Is Without You. Oh, the best. Right? Oh, and that beautiful. was off of uh, Nielsen Schmielsen. And the same album was uh, Coconut. Right. You know, well, you know, there's this big resurgence of ABBA, yeah. and his music is kind of that nostalgic, mm -hmm. easy to listen to music. But you couldn't have been doing this if you didn't mm -hmm. have the genes. You had the DNA here, yeah. Lee. Yeah. And where where did they come well, from? Well, my my background, my grandfather's one was Jimmy McHugh, who was a songwriter who wrote songs like "I'm in the Mood for Love" and "Sunny Side of the Street." I can't give you anything but love, baby. And then on the other side of the family, uh, Eddie Cantor, <laughs> who was... Uh, it's so amazing that this could all be in one family. Song and dance man, yeah. And um, <laughs> so, of course, I mean, that, that you know, was an influence as well, because I used to hear their songs growing up, 
you know, all the time. You remember them? Uh, or you just heard their song? No, Cantor I don't remember. Cantor we have a picture of, and it looks like it's from the four, early 40s? No, actually, that's from 1932. That's oh, a photograph wow. of him getting his footprints at the Chinese theater. Wow. And um, Cantor <laughs> died the year I was born. So basically, the story I've been told is I, I came out of my mother, they put me on his bed, and then he went. But um, that's not true. It's that's a, little that's humor. a good story. He also <laughs> did. He wrote uh, the Bugs Bunny theme song, you know, the ba 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 ba, that's played every second of the day somewhere around the world. He wrote it in 1935 for his radio show. Warner Brothers picked it up and has used it for the last. 60 years as the theme song. Do they give him credit? Because I had no idea that he wrote that. Yeah, well a lot of people don't know he, that he wrote the song, but he also wrote it with words, and it's never been done before with the words until my album. Oh, and your CD you brought with Which, us? Which, yes, is Lee called Newman. Relatively Singing, and it's on original cast records, and it's out in stores now. And on the album I'm doing songs that Eddie Cantor and Jimmy McHugh either wrote or made famous. Just, so, yeah. just those songs, and which a, is so great. And a couple of mine as well. So you're writing too. But yeah, so, um, but the, the Bugs Bunny theme song has never been done before with the words. What kind of words are they? Um, the chorus goes, um, mm, and merrily we roll along, my honey and me. Verily, there's no one quite as happy as we. Though we're twice as poor as my say, what do we care as we merrily roll along? But that's all, folks. And then the pig comes on. Do they do? But you know, well, sometimes, yeah. Did he write yeah. that? No, he just wrote. He just wrote the melody and 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 the words. Because I would, if I had to answer, do you want to be a millionaire? Mm -hmm. I would say it was a Warner Brothers song. Right. A lot of people don't know that he wrote it. He wrote it for his radio show. Warner Brothers picked it up, and that's uh, great. Yeah. It's great. So uh, you're singing both grandfathers? So I play a lot around in L.A. I mean, I play like at the Whiskey and the Roxy, and um, I play songs they wrote or made famous, as, as well as some of my own tunes. Do you call it cabaret? You know, I don't call no. it cabaret. Um, and maybe that's what it is. I don't know. I'm asking because I'm not sure. I'm not, really, I'm not really sure either. I'm trying to find out today. <laughs> I was talking to somebody in the green room about that. <laughs> I, I'm not really sure. I mean, basically what I do, it's easy listening. You uh -huh. know, pop. But you sort play of in jazz. small venues. Well, the whiskey. I just did a show at the oh, whiskey, that's not and so it's small. That's no. not cabaret style. See, is it? yeah, but then you could put me. I've done the Cinegrill, which is cabaret. So that is style. a cabaret right, right. sort of a room. So. Um, well, you started you singing. Know. Did you act? As a child, yeah. I um, and whenever I can get a gig today, I I started out um, at the age of seven in a film called Every Little Crook and Nanny that was directed by Cy Howard. Oh, I and, and I did that over at MGM, and I, I wanted to focus on that, you know, but my parents wanted me to continue with school and uh, really but focus on that, so, so I did that, and... Um, did you learn mu music in school? No, you, no. So you were just straight academic class? I just, I learned from listening to Burt Backrack records and Harry Nielsen records and the Beach Boys, you know, but I, I always wanted to uh, to sing and to do that and um, uh, the guitar was self-taught. I just picked it up right? and while I was at Hollywood High School just started to play with it and, and, and started to uh, and started to get it and then I started singing in clubs, uh, I don't know, maybe about seven years ago. And you and um, worked with Dick Van Dyke. And I've done, yeah, in like TV? A, in recent years I've done a couple episodes of uh, Diagnosis Murder and it's a great show, and he's a great guy, and they're going into their seventh season. And, um, and then, you know, as I said, I, I play a lot around town about once or twice a month. What about, did you do a movie with Sally Kirkland, or did you work on TV mm -hmm. with her? Um, yes, we did. We did do a film together uh, that I was part of called Starry Night which I believe is mm. coming out in, in the near Something, future. Yeah. And I know Sally because she threw my record release party for I me see, for this when this came out. But what so happens you know, at, when you do like a record release party, say, and do all these famous songwriters and song people come because of your family? Yeah, or they it's, know it's, you it's or? who's ever in town and whoever wants to come and eat and drink. <laughs> but um, yeah, she, she hosted it and uh, it was a big thrill for me because her, Arthur Hiller was there, who's like my favorite 
uh, director. director. And uh, Elliot Mintz was there, and Rod Steiger was there, and uh, Ringo Starr was invited. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> you know, he missed out. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, so we, we had this celebration of of the songs, and you know, um, as I do in in my set, you know, I tell stories behind some of these songs, some of like the McHugh. But see, that's where cabaret comes in, right. doesn't it? That's what I was finding out ten minutes ago. Yeah, yeah, I think that that part of telling the story, like before, there's a song of McHugh's that I do, and I'll give you the story uh, real quickly. It was the depression and he was totally wiped out. He lost everything. And he was walking along Riverside Drive one day and he bumps into George Gershwin. And <laughs> Gershwin asked him, how, how are things going? He says, not too well. He says, I haven't got a quarter in my pocket. And Gershwin said, well, that shouldn't happen to you. Is there anything I can do to help? And he said, yeah, if you happen to have a piano lying <laughs> around, I could use that. So the next week, Gershwin sent him a gray upright piano, which we still have in the family You're today. Kidding. And the first song McHugh wrote on that piano was on the sunny side of the street. Because so that's he was walking down the street, this was sunny for him because mm -hmm. he got his piano. He was I broke, guess. yeah. And he wrote that tune on that piano and he cherished it for years oh. and we still have it in the family. What a great story because Gershwin died very young too. I think he was like 37. He, yeah, he died very young. Mm -hmm. So it was a good thing he gave you your grandfather the piano before. <laughs> Yeah, it was. So um, it put him on. It put him back on the track. Was right. he writing songs before that? Yeah, he had a lot of success uh, over at the Cotton Club. McHugh uh, was writing songs for the Cotton Club I see. and um, for Bill Bojangles Robinson and Cab Calloway, Ethel Waters, and uh, songs like "When My Sugar Walks Down the Street." Oh, he did. I must have that man, you know. And he brought Duke Ellington to the Cotton Club. He introduced Duke Ellington um, to the Cotton Club. So, um, but I've always loved doing these songs, you know. Well, and, we've got to uh, we've got to hear these songs, and we're we're gonna look for you. I think if people just keep their ears open, they're gonna start hearing Lee Newman, and then this whole burst of background is right. gonna come out. Oh, well, thanks so, so much. No, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thanks a lot, and thanks for watching Lee Newman. Now you're gonna come back with Ming Stoll. I'm going to come back with Ming Stoll. See you in a minute. Hello, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with Ming Stoll, who was born in Baltimore and, as she says, attended a series of Catholic and public schools barely escaping in the mid-60s. I hated it. <laughs> I hated school. I used to get straight A's when I was a kid. For some reason, in Catholic school, the nuns felt sorry for me, or what? I don't know what it was. I could spell, and my grammar was good. So that was enough for Catholic school. That was but, what they cared about. But Mink is a pop icon, a cult super scar, <laughs> <laughs> and a result of all of her appearances in filmmaker John Waters' yes. uh, movies. It, I guess it's the reason they call you a pop icon and a... I would assume so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, they call me a pop icon and, and people call me a superstar and it's like, where's my swimming pool? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, if I'm all of these things, where... But, uh, Do people chase after you? It happens on, on a... Actually, a few weeks ago it did happen to me where someone actually chased me out of a restaurant. And that was... Um, it was kind of nice. I was going to say, isn't it kind <laughs> it of exciting? Kind of nice, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't happen so often that it would interfere with my life. I mean, it, it, you know, I have every, you know, I mean, I can go to the supermarket, I can go to the bookstore, I can, I can shop. But unfortunately, usually when I'm recognized, I have a theory or a philosophy that within a certain number of miles from my house, I can look however I want to look. I don't have to dress up for it. But unfortunately, that'll be when. You know, I'll be in the in the somewhere in Glendale at some <laughs> hardware store in Glendale, you know, <coughs> buying a screw or some copper tubing or whatever it is, and then you know somebody comes to me and say, "Aren't you being stole?" And it'd be like, you know, my hair will be dirty. Don't you love it? And it's like I go, well, I would be if I were clean. <laughs> don't you? But don't you always like? Oh, I love I my do. Fans. I do. I really do. I mean, if it happened more often, I probably wouldn't. But it happens often enough that it does feed. But we were talking about John Waters. Did he actually give you your start in show business? Yeah, yeah he actually did. In pop culture? Yeah. In pop culture. But I mean, we started basically together. 
Uh -huh. uh, when I met John, he wasn't John Waters, the fabulous director. He was John Waters, the gawky, skinny guy with the, with the aviator sunglasses that wanted to make movies. And, uh, you know, I... You met him in Baltimore, I I actually probably. met him in Provincetown. Oh, you met him in Provincetown. I met him in Provincetown. Uh, I was looking for anything. I was experience hungry. I met him when I was just uh, 18. So did you want to be an actress? Oh, I had thought about being an actress, but I wasn't very motivated about doing anything about it. So, I see. so um, but when I met him, he wasn't a filmmaker. I mean, he'd made one 15-minute film. Oh, I see. So, I mean, he wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be an actress. So, I mean, we met so, at a very good time. So it was great because you've been in 12 of his oh, movies? Oh, I think 12 or 13, yes. So all of his movies? No, have you been all in? of his features. All of his features. But there are a couple of shorts. There's a, I wasn't in Eat Your Makeup and I wasn't in the Diane Linkletter story. Oh, oh those were the first, yeah. Yeah, and I, and, uh, well, I knew him then, but there were reasons, I mean, I was in Europe for one of them and I was, had hepatitis for another one, so. But, but actually, do we count John Waters for making you famous? Um, gee. I, I suppose you'd have to, but I really begrudge. I begrudge giving people credit for, for but who the, I But am. the other thing is, what what made you the most notable? What well, made you working the most with John, famous? absolutely. No, but what movie? Oh, Pink Flamingos and Female Trouble. Okay, without that's what without I question. Okay, yeah, tell us absolutely. about Pink Flamingos. Your role. Uh, and those two roles were totally th those, different. Those two roles were very different. <laughs> and in the first one, I played a suburban housewife who um, made her money by selling drugs to, to school kids and by selling uh, the babies of lesbian couples. My husband and I would kidnap teenage girls and we would sell their baby. We would have them impregnated by our servant and then we would sell their babies to lesbian couples. And what was your name? Connie Marble. Connie Marble. And I had hair the color of, a, you know, the red of a Marlboro box, <laughs> which was really a lot of fun because, as you know, nobody did that back then. And um, you couldn't buy red hair color. That what color. year was it? That was 1971. Okay, all right. So, Connie Marble. Connie Marble. And her horrible husband. And her horrible husband. And who wrote that, that bizarre thing? John Waters. Did he write it all he wrote alone, or do you No, have no, 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 gosh, no. No input? Oh, none whatsoever. If we so much as put in a comma, he would get hysterical. Is that right? Absolutely. That's interesting. No ands, no thes, no. And if you, if you ever watch those movies again, you'll notice that we never take a pause. We're talk, 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 your turn, talk, 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 your turn, talk, 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 talk. I mean, there's no, the no dramatic moments, there's no pauses, there's no quiet moments. That's really interesting because looking at those kind of movies, you'd think, oh, he just let anybody do anything. Oh, gosh, no. And he would stand behind the camera and lip, you know, and mouth the words. So you did that. And then what was the next one? And the next one was Female Trouble. And in Female Trouble, I played a 14-year-old girl. You know, it's bizarre. I can't. Really? I remember that girl? She was the competition to Divine? Well, no, Connie was the competition. Connie Marble in Female Trouble was the competition for Divine. Okay. Divine as Babs and Johnson. The, and, then and then in Female Trouble, I played Divine's daughter. Oh, Divine's daughter, right. I played right. her daughter. And, and, and she was always taking you out, making you do everything? Well, she actually never did take me out. That was the problem. <laughs> I was, you know, I was, I was chained to the bed. I was kept inside. And... Um, <laughs> And, I, you know, I, we hated each other. I mean, she, you know, she, uh, one of the famous lines was, I beat her with the car antenna. I don't know what else to do with her. You know, so, um, I mean, working with Divine was so incredible because Divine was so incredibly present, you know, to the other <coughs> actor and on the film and, and working with Divine. It was like, I had to work so hard just to just so people would see me on the screen. Oh, I see what you you're know, saying. I mean, there was this divine was this enormous presence. Right. I mean, physical presence, and also so, so extraordinary looking. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that I would think I would never think of having to play in the same scene with him, but I could imagine what it was I, like. It, it was it was hard. <laughs> and the other thing with Divi, I wouldn't ever think that he could remember his lines oh, that John yes. wrote, but he did. Oh, yes. So he well, didn't ad lib either. Uh, none of us did. As a matter of fact, we were so well trained and so disciplined that we almost invariably got everything done in one take. And if you look at those early oh. times, those early films, they're all done in master shots. There are no cutaways. So if a scene is two pages long, you start at the beginning and you end two pages later, and everybody has to remember every bit of dialogue. And one person forgets a line, and you start at the top.
Uh, and you go through it all over. How? So we couldn't do that. I mean, we didn't, nobody wanted to be the one to forget the lines. Would you call your time with John um, your training ground, or did you take acting lessons? I took, I've taken acting lessons off and on, um, and, and uh, I would call my time with John my training ground, absolutely. That was for movies, but what about on stage? Because you have done some stage work. I've done quite a bit work. of stage work. Uh, it's, it's the same and it's different. Do you like stage work? I love stage work. I love an audience. I love being present to an audience. Um, and that flying without a net feeling, you know? I mean, and because it's happened to me where I've been on stage and I have completely blanked and I'll turn up stage to the actor I'm working with and go, I don't know what. I'm supposed to say next. I mean, it's happened. But it depends on who you're working with, too, how you can do and it. And some people are wonderful to work with, and some people are not wonderful to work with. The thing about movies that I really love is they're forever. I, that's what I like, too. You know, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's the thing about stage that's wonderful, is that it's not. You know, so, I mean, they're, they're two entirely different mediums. That's really interesting, because I know you've done a lot of independent movies, right. which I think help I mean, I'm saying, as an actress, you're helping an independent producer, director go somewhere. And I know you worked with Greg Araki. I have. I, I had a wonderful cameo in Splendor. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it was really fun. I and mean, there's I a new, the, the I want to be a cheerleader. That's but, also But I'm a cheerleader, which I oh, worked Oh, but with, I'm a cheerleader. Right. right. And, and then that, Bud Court and I play the parents of Natasha Leone. Right. Which so, is, the, but that was an independent film. That was very independent. Uh -huh. As a matter of very fact. Very independent. <laughs> well, it was actually less independent than some I've done. Uh, I've worked on, I mean, it's, you know, somebody has a dollar to make a movie. Oh, call Mink. She'll work. <laughs> She'll do it. Um, so but, do people call you Mink? Oh, yeah, always. We don't know what your real name is. It's Nancy. But Stoll. nobody ever call. Oh, it is Stoll? Nancy Stoll, yeah. So did, did John name you Mink? Well, John named me Mink, but at my, I, I requested it. It was, I, I've always thought that Nancy was a dull and boring name, and Nancy Stoll is the... I love it. So I asked him, I said, you have to, when we were working on our first film together, which was 1966, doing a film called <laughs> Roman Candles, I said, I can't take the name, you've got to change the name. And it was the era of Viva and, you know, oh. <laughs> so, you know, we were talking, you know, the, the 60s, middle 60s. Fabulous so, names. Fa fabulous names. Uh, Viva and Ultraviolet, right. you know, so Mink Stoll was a natural. But, you know, but did, it stuck. Did you ever get, did you ever, did people think that you were part of the Warhol group? Oh, it happens all the time. People introduce me at parties, and this is Mink Stoll. She used to work with Warhol. Well, they I never, must think you I were. never even met Andy Warhol. Isn't that funny? But but I know several of the Warhol people. I mean, I know Joe D'Alessandro, and I know Holly Woodlawn, and I know right. Mary Warnoff. So I mean, it's not as though I never met. No, but they. But, but we're a very different group of people. I mean, they were in New York, and we were in Baltimore. And the other thing was when I introduced Divine to Andy. Well, and Divi just stuck his clutches in and never left because he thought he looked at Andy and I think he was thinking of expanding <laughs> his career well, <laughs> or what he could get from Andy, which he did pretty well. I mean, he was going home with posters cover of and photographs and right, all that yeah, stuff. He, he got uh, the... So, but were they in competition? I never even thought about this. I don't think this. so. I don't think they were. They were... Warhol was an enormous influence on Waters. I don't know that Waters was ever an influence on Warhol. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, I mean, the first movie that I did with John, which was Roman Candles, is triple projected, and it's, you know, like Chelsea Girls. I see, I so, see. So, um, I, I, they knew each other, but I don't think there was... I see, but Andy was start, probably started before John anyway. Andy did. Yeah. 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 So, what's your favorite role? Oh, Taffy Davenport in Female Trouble. And what did Taffy do? And Taffy was the 14-year-old child, the daughter of Divine. And uh, th that was just, Taffy, Taffy walked around in uh, ballerina tutus, and I mean, I dressed like, a, I was dressed as a nine-year-old. And what and, about and your... And my hair was blonde. Was it your blonde. own hair? It was my own hair. I've always used my own hair. Uh, and, um, and my makeup was sort of smeared around my face, and, you know, little ballerina tutus. Did you take dance lessons? I took, uh, oh, yeah, off and on. I've but taken you were, tap lessons. Did you want to be a professional dancer no. ever? 
No. I just, mean, <laughs> yes, when I was five. Okay, when I was five and six, I wanted to be a professional tap dancer. And my mother would not give me tap lessons because she thought they were trashy. Oh, <laughs> so, so, so let's go so back to I, mom. How did she <laughs> handle John Waters? Oh, it was a real conflict for her because she, she really likes John. I mean, he's a charming man. But she man. has this Catholic school daughter. But she daughter. has this Catholic school, <laughs> and my mother is a very devout Catholic, so it was hard for her. You know, uh, she saw the earliest film I did, and then she would not go to any more. She wouldn't see a film uh, until Polyester. Oh, which was she, an which easy was, one Which is an easy take. one, yes. And she's actually in Hairspray. My mother's an extra in Hairspray. Oh, that's cool. So, uh, so we got her, we got her into yeah, it. Yeah, she's fine. So she's fine she's now. She's fine now. Now, one, one thing before we leave, you talk um, about being around so much. Yeah. I think you've been around a lot. You're get, writing an advice column. It's my favorite thing that I do. I have never had more fun in my life. And in Glue Magazine? I, yeah, for Glue Magazine. Um, they, they called, the Lori Pike, who is the editor-in-chief, called me up a couple years ago when she was getting ready to start the magazine and asked me to write the column. And I jumped at it. It's really, it's really a lot of what, fun. What, are they actual people? Do people actually people write you actually, letters? People actually write letters, and I actually answer them. They, uh, I don't write any of them. I mean, the, because I've, you think that this is phony. It's not. It's not. And, and there's... There, a uh, couple of criteria that I use, and one of them is I really care that the advice is responsible and good advice. Is that right? Absolutely. So it's very serious. It, well, no, it's funny. But I mean, it's funny, but it's, it's serious. Funny. And, funny. And, and, and the challenge is to get good advice in an entertaining format right. in a paragraph. That's you. That's me. And then what kind of uh, uh, the question, questions? The questions come in. One question came in a woman, uh, I assume it was a woman, I don't always know, <laughs> was uh, a, she was concerned because her best friend had just joined 12 Steps and she was going to kill him. She was just, he was, you know, no sense of humor at all. And every time she took a drink, she, she got a lecture. So, you know, I told her that, you know, she had to have more than usual patience, but that she could tell him that if he, you know, continued to preach at her as she couldn't let him do that because she was just enabling him to be an asshole. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, but the, the, the point but those is... those kind of things, I mean, that's a pretty... These are real things that happen to people. And it's normal because that's what happens to you if you're the friend of someone who's it, trying to do anything. It can drive you crazy. Yeah, and they want you to be a part of it right. or they want to prove that. So I think of myself, you know, sort of as the Glinda the Good Witch of advice columnists or the antidote to um, Dr. Laura. Okay. That's what we want. Yeah. We, we, we yeah. want Glenda we, we, on our show. We want Glenda. <laughs> Thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much, Joan. I've had a wonderful time. Oh, I'm so glad you were here. Thank and you. And thank you, uh, all of you, for watching today. And keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 40th floor, Los Angeles 917. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. This was so <laughs>